Welcome to Terminology in Healthcare in Public Health Settings, Blood, Lymphatic, and Immune Systems. The objectives for this unit, Blood, Lymphatic, and Immune Systems, are to define, understand, and correctly pronounce various medical terms related to the blood, lymphatic, and immune systems. Describe common diseases and conditions with an overview of various treatments related to the blood, lymphatic, and immune systems. Let's begin by taking a look at our blood and how it is produced. The average adult has about 5 liters of blood that circulates throughout the body within the blood vessels. Blood cells are produced in red bone marrow. In addition to blood cells and blood cell fragments, our blood also contains water and other substances such as proteins and platelets. Our blood serves to transport substances throughout the body. These substances attach themselves to red blood cells or are dissolved in the blood plasma. One of the most important components of our blood is the white blood cell. White blood cells fight infection and disease. You might like to think of white blood cells as the Pac-Men of the blood system because they travel throughout our bodies eating up bacteria and other infectious agents. Platelets are another essential ingredient of our blood. Platelets help in the clotting process. The cells in blood fall into three main categories. Erythrocytes, or red blood cells, carry oxygen to tissues and cells throughout the body. Erythrocytes also pick up carbon dioxide, which is then eliminated through the lungs of the respiratory system. The second category of blood cells, thrombocytes, also known as platelets, are critical in the blood clotting process. Without thrombocytes, a simple cut might mean that you would bleed to death. The third category, leukocytes or white blood cells, provide protection against bacteria, viruses, and foreign materials. These solid blood cells are carried around the body in plasma. Plasma makes up the fluid part of the blood. Plasma is about 90% water. The remaining 10% is composed of proteins, dissolved substances such as nutrients, hormones, respiratory gases, etc. If you have ever donated blood, you probably know that people have different types of blood. Although all blood is made of the same basic elements, not all blood is alike. In fact, there are eight different common blood types. These types are determined by the presence or absence of certain antigens, substances that can trigger an immune response if they are foreign to the body. Since some antigens can trigger a patient's immune system to attack the transfused blood, safe blood transfusions depend on careful blood typing and cross-matching for antigens and antibodies. Antibodies are made of B cells produced in response to a foreign antigen. Antibodies neutralize or destroy antigens. It is important to know what antigens and antibodies are present in the blood. There are four major blood groups determined by the presence or absence of two antigens, A and B, on the surface of red blood cells. Group A has only the A antigen on red cells and B antibody in the plasma. Group B has only the B antigen on red cells and A antibody in the plasma. Group AB has both A and B antigens on red cells, but neither A nor B antibodies in the plasma. Group O has neither A nor B antigens on red cells, but both A and B antibodies are in the plasma. Group O can donate red blood cells to anybody. If you have type O blood, then you are known as a universal donor. In addition to the A and B antigens, there is a third antigen called the Rh factor, which can be either present, positive, or absent, negative. In general, Rh negative blood is given to Rh negative patients, and Rh positive blood or Rh negative blood may be given to Rh positive patients. The universal red cell donor 
has type O negative blood type. The universal plasma donor has type AB positive blood type. What are some of the disorders that can affect our blood? One common blood disorder is iron deficiency anemia. Your body needs iron to make hemoglobin. Hemoglobin gives blood its red color. When your iron levels get low, you have what's called iron deficiency anemia. Iron levels might be too low because of heavy menstrual periods, pregnancy, ulcers, colon polyps, colon cancer, inherited disorders, or a diet that does not have enough iron. Anemia can make you feel weak, cold, dizzy, and irritable. It is confirmed with a blood test. Once you become deficient in iron to the point that anemia develops, increased intake of iron-rich foods is beneficial, but is usually not enough to correct the problem. You need iron supplementation to build back your iron reserves, as well as to meet your body's daily iron requirements. Iron deficiency can't be corrected overnight. You may need to take iron supplements for several months or longer to replenish your iron reserves. Generally, you'll start to feel better after a week or so of treatment. Sickle cell anemia is another blood disorder. It is a disease in which the body produces abnormally shaped red blood cells. The cells are shaped like crescents or sickles. These blood cells are more fragile than normal round red blood cells and more prone to rupture. This in turn leads to anemia. The sickle cells also get stuck in blood vessels, blocking blood flow. This can cause pain and organ damage. This disorder is caused by a genetic problem. People with sickle cell anemia are born with two sickle cell genes, one from each parent. If you only have one sickle cell gene, you have what is called sickle cell trait. About 1 in 12 African Americans has sickle cell trait. A blood test can show if you have either the sickle cell trait or the anemia. Sickle cell anemia has no widely available cure. However, treatments can help relieve symptoms and treat complications. The goals of treating sickle cell anemia are to relieve pain, prevent infections, organ damage, and strokes, and control complications if they occur. Blood and marrow stem cell transplants may offer a cure for a small number of people who have sickle cell anemia. Researchers continue to look for new treatments for the disease. Here are some key word parts dealing with the blood, along with their meanings. In the third column, you can see some of the medical terms that we can create by combining word parts. You should return to the online medical dictionary to hear the pronunciation and become familiar with the meaning of the created terms. Now let's turn our attention to the lymphatic and immune systems. The organs of the lymphatic system are the lymph nodes, lymphatic vessels, thymus gland, spleen, and the tonsils. The lymphatic system is comprised of a network of vessels whose function is to pick up excess tissue fluid, cleanse it, and return it to the circulatory system. Another function of the lymphatic system is to pick up fats that are absorbed by the digestive system. The primary function of the immune system is to fight disease and infections. Immunity is the body's ability to defend itself against pathogens. Pathogens can be bacteria, 
viruses, fungi, protozoans, toxins, and even cancerous tumors. There are two forms of immunity, natural immunity and acquired immunity. Let's look at these two in a little more detail. Natural immunity is also called innate immunity. Natural immunity is resistance that one inherits from one's parents. It is not specific to a particular disease and doesn't require prior exposure to a pathogen or invading organism. An example of natural immunity is when white blood cells ingest any pathogen encountered. Acquired immunity, on the other hand, is the body's response to a specific pathogen. There are two types of acquired immunity, passive acquired immunity or active acquired immunity. Passive acquired immunity is the result of receiving protective substances produced by another human or animal, such as maternal antibodies or antitoxin. One example of passive acquired immunity would include disease resistance obtained by an infant who is fed with breast milk. In contrast, active acquired immunity develops following a direct exposure to a particular pathogen. This stimulated immune response results in a series of mechanisms designed to neutralize that pathogen. When we receive immunizations or vaccinations against, for example, chickenpox or rubella, they are designed to provide us with a type of active acquired immunity. As you can imagine, there are lots of diseases and disorders that negatively affect the lymphatic system. One common condition of the lymphatic system is lymphedema. Edema, or swelling, may happen when there is an increase in fluid in the body or because of a blockage in the lymphatic system. The accumulation of lymph is referred to as lymphedema. The causes of lymphedema include various infections, cancer, scar tissue from radiation therapy, or surgical removal of lymph nodes, and inherited conditions in which lymph nodes or vessels are absent or abnormal. Treatment of lymphedema includes physical methods such as compression stockings and medicines. Another problem that affects the lymphatic system is tonsillitis. Tonsillitis is the inflammation of the tonsils. The tonsils are two oval-shaped pads of tissue at the back of the throat. There is one tonsil on each side. Signs and symptoms of tonsillitis include swollen tonsils, sore throat, and difficulty swallowing. Most cases of tonsillitis are caused by infection with a common virus but a bacterial infection also may cause tonsillitis. Appropriate treatment depends on the cause. If tonsillitis is caused by a bacterial infection, the doctor will prescribe a course of antibiotics. Surgery to remove the tonsils is called a tonsillectomy. Tonsillectomies may be used to treat frequently recurring tonsillitis, chronic tonsillitis, or bacterial tonsillitis that doesn't respond to antibiotic treatment. Frequent tonsillitis is generally defined as occurring more than six times in one year or more than four times in a year over a two-year period or more than three times in a year over a three-year period. A tonsillectomy is usually done as a one-day surgery. A complete recovery usually takes seven to ten days. A condition of the immune system of serious concern is AIDS. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. 
It is the most advanced stage of infection with the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. HIV is a virus that kills or damages the cells of the body's immune system. By damaging your immune system, HIV interferes with your body's ability to fight the organisms that cause disease. HIV most often spreads through unprotected sex with an infected person. AIDS may also be spread by sharing drug needles or through contact with the blood of an infected person. In addition, women who are infected with HIV can give it to their babies during pregnancy or childbirth. The first signs of HIV infection may be swollen glands and flu-like symptoms. These may come and go a month or two after infection. Severe symptoms may not appear until months or years later. By the time AIDS develops, your immune system has been severely damaged, making you susceptible to opportunistic infections, diseases that wouldn't normally trouble a person with a healthy immune system. A blood test can tell if you have the HIV infection. While there is no cure, there are various drugs that can be used in combination and are available, which can fight both the HIV infection and the infections and cancers that come with it. Today, individuals who are on medications can live with the disease for many years. Here are some key word parts for the lymphatic and immune systems along with their meanings. In the third column, you can see some of the medical terms that we can create by combining word parts. You should return to the online medical dictionary to hear the pronunciation and become familiar with the meaning of the created terms. Now that you know something about the lymphatic and immune systems, see if you can solve the mystery that appears on this slide. James complains of soaking night sweats, fatigue, shaking chills, weight loss, swollen lymph nodes, persistent white spots on his tongue, and headaches. This is indicative of tonsillitis, iron deficiency anemia, AIDS. Did you guess AIDS? If no treatment is provided for the HIV infection, the disease typically progresses to AIDS in about 10 years. By the time AIDS develops, the immune system has been severely damaged, making one susceptible to opportunistic infections, diseases that wouldn't trouble a person with a healthy immune system. The signs and symptoms of some of these infections may include soaking night sweats, shaking chills or fever higher than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees centigrade, for several weeks, chronic diarrhea, persistent white spots or unusual lesions on the tongue or mouth, headaches, persistent unexplained fatigue, swollen lymph nodes, weight loss. This concludes blood, lymphatic, and immune systems. In summary, we have discussed medical terms related to the blood, lymphatic, and immune systems. You should understand the meanings of these terms and be able to pronounce them. You should also be able to describe common diseases and conditions and medical and surgical procedures and medications related to the blood, lymphatic, and immune systems.